I was also a kid of the Jetsons era. Like, I want to have a flying car. If I could get on a Hyperloop and go from New York to LA in two and a half hours or whatever it's going to be, like, sign me up. I'm here for it. Welcome to the Best New Ideas in Money, a podcast from MarketWatch. I'm Stephanie Kelton. I'm an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. And I'm Charles Passy, a reporter at MarketWatch. Each week, we explore innovations in economics, finance, technology, and policy that rethink the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. This week, we're talking about the future of public transportation and just how futuristic it will be. Five, four, three, two, one, launch. That's the countdown from an actual Hyperloop test that took place in Nevada just two years ago. A Hyperloop is a new technology that runs passengers and freight through essentially a vacuum tube. So it uses very little energy and it moves very fast. We'll learn more about that later, but first, let's start with the recent piece of legislation that has the potential to reshape the way millions of us move around in our day-to-day lives. In November, Congress passed a $1 trillion infrastructure bill. The House passing a $1 trillion infrastructure bill, a bipartisan achievement and a massive investment in the nation's outdated infrastructure. We spoke to Congressman Peter DeFazio, who's one of the architects of the bill, and you could say a bit of a transit aficionado. U.S. Representative, 4th District, Oregon, chair of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, 65th longest serving member of Congress in the history of the United States out of 14,300 people with 36 years of service. I talked to Congressman DeFazio about how and where that money is going to be spent. America's fallen apart. We have 42,000 bridges on the national highway system need substantial repair replacement. 40% of the national highway system needs to be rebuilt, not just paved over. And we have over a hundred billion dollar backlog to bring existing transit up to a state of good repair, let alone, you know, give people new and better transit options and improve transit. The bill allocates $108 billion for transit. A lot of that money will go to repairing or replacing transportation systems that have been failing for a long time. Here in the nation's capital, the metro system had degraded to the point where they're actually killing people. The metro system was investigated by the National Transportation Safety Bureau in 2016. A year earlier, a smoke-filled tunnel caused one death and many injuries. And in 2009, a rush hour collision killed nine. Finally, they're doing a major investment in new rolling stock and repairing a lot of the tracks and new signalization and modern ways of tracking the trains and keeping them apart, as opposed to having a dispatcher trying to watch a very complicated board and keep the trains from running into one another. The bill could also fund transportation innovation. Innovation like a potential new project in Los Angeles. A new rail system would tunnel through the mountains to the northeast, linking areas where there's a lot more affordable housing. People in the L.A. Basin are being priced out, and they would be able to live over on that side of the mountains and get to work downtown more quickly than they can today if they live in one of the, you know, 15 mile away, less expensive suburbs. So these are promising things on the horizon. Another top concern for DeFazio is addressing climate change those climate provisions in the bill. They're going to make states measure their greenhouse gas reductions, and they're going to condition grants on things that deal with equity, greenhouse gas reductions, and they have $100 billion of discretionary grants plus the targeted money for the electrification of the National Highway Network. It is going to help with the climate issue, and a lot of the discretion is going to go to states. How substantially are we you know, fixing what we have and how much more, even after this bill, is there left to do just to address the fundamental shortcomings with what exists today? Part of it will be new investment to provide new options. I mean, there's a lot of equity issues in transportation. The idea is we're going to provide more efficient service. I had a principle called fix it first, which made a lot of sense to me, which said, okay, Uh, First, let's fix the existing infrastructure. Second, if you were going to build a new capacity, first you have to look at all the alternatives. And I was inspired by Virginia. 
Virginia was going to add two lanes from D.C. down to Richmond on the incredibly congested highway there, 95. Everybody saw it on television this winter uh, when it got snowed in. An epic traffic disaster playing out over the last 36 hours in Virginia. Thousands of cars brought to a standstill by that massive storm dropping a foot of snow on the D.C. region. They said, well, this is going to cost $12 billion. It's going to take 10 years. And at the end of 10 years, it's going to be just as congested as it is today. It's called induced demand. That's what usually happens when you widen a road. The traffic just expands to fill it. The state of Virginia scrapped the highway expansion plan in favor of a new public transportation option, connecting rail lines from D.C. to Richmond. The state convinced the freight company there to share its rails in exchange for access to a new bridge. The numbers are great. They calculate they will get more single occupancy or you know, individual vehicles off the road and reduce carbon emissions, and it's going to cost less. We have a lot of opportunities here to deal meaningfully with rebuilding our infrastructure and at the same time dealing with climate change. But building greener public solutions isn't the only improvement our transit systems need. Transit is at a existential crossroads right now, having lost so much of its ridership uh, due to the pandemic that likely will never return to the way that it was before. But that doesn't necessarily mean that transit is a dead industry. Ryan Harris is transit planning manager with engineering firm STV in New York. He says that investing in data analytics and taking advantage of current technology can go a long way toward improving our transportation systems. Agencies are trying to implement like bus network redesigns to, to really rationalize where service is needed as opposed to, you know, putting a bus on a major road because it looks like it makes sense on a map, but really understanding with data where people are going and what sorts of trips transit could provide that it hasn't historically been providing. Harris says using anonymized location data from people's cell phones can help urban planners figure out where and when people need to travel. We used to have to go out to ride buses with paper surveys and ask people where they started and ended their trip and what the trip was for. And that information is now becoming almost real time for us. So we can make much more nimble decisions about the types and amounts of service that should be provided. That data can help improve our current transit options, but it can also be used to make decisions about what the future of transportation will look like. It's fun to think about flying cars, but Harris says they're still far off, and there are other investments we can make in the near term before that technology is fully ready. I will give my professional opinion that Hyperloop and flying Ubers and even to some degree automated and self-driving cars are likely well into the future. You know, it looks flashy and it looks great, uh, but likely not realistic. The, the thing with self-driving cars is that we still haven't been able to figure out pedestrian safety and liability issues, and that will come in time. But I, I think there's a really great opportunity to implement self-driving operation on buses. They follow the same route day in, day out. They don't need to operate in the same sort of, I'll call it ad hoc manner that cars do. From an innovation perspective, there's a lot of tinkering around the edges that can be done. Coming up, helicopter taxis, hyperloops, and bikes that ride themselves. We'll hear about all of that after the break. Welcome back to the Best New Ideas in Money. Before the break, we heard about some of the ways the recent infrastructure bill might improve or at least repair a public transit system near you. But what about the transit systems of the future? I asked Congressman Peter DeFazio about that. What is the best new idea in public transportation and what cities and towns are breaking new ground? 
Champaign, Urbana, Illinois had some hydrogen fuel cell buses. That, I mean, the technology works really well. I mean, it's very proven. Hydrogen is extracted from, you know, natural gas. It's a fossil fuel. But you can create green hydrogen by cracking water. And so they're going to use the solar array to crack water and fuel their buses with non-fossil fuel hydrogen. When Congressman DeFazio says crack water, he means hydrogen and oxygen atoms are split apart, and the buses use the hydrogen as fuel. Another new approach to an existing transit option is being developed at the MIT City Science Research Group. Naroa Coretti is a researcher and PhD student who's working on one of the most common problems when it comes to bike sharing programs. It's very difficult to find a free dog for your bicycle. And in other situations, it's difficult to find an available bicycle. In the MIT project, the bike will come to you. It will have an autonomous mode where the bicycle will balance itself on three wheels until it arrives at the rider's location. The idea is that by coming straight to the user, the bikes will be able to complete more trips than they do with current bike share programs. And that might also help reduce fleet sizes. The autonomous shared bike is still in the experimental stage, but here's how it would work. So, for example, it could work as Uber or Lyft. The customers would order a bike through an app on their phone. Then the bike would autonomously come to them. To maintain its balance, it would show up in a tricycle configuration. Upon arrival, it would transform back into a two-wheeler. And then the user would use it just as a regular bicycle. So we are not proposing the autonomy for the part when the user is using it. They would actually pedal to their destination. Hyperloop is another potentially exciting technology. That's the vacuum-propelled system we mentioned that will transport you really, really fast. Here's Congressman DeFazio again. It's a very exciting technology. And the advantage over high-speed rail is the Hyperloop can take any kind of a grade so if this technology works out, you could use the median of a highway, and when you come to a bridge, you could either go over it or you can tunnel under it, which you can't do with high-speed rail. If you want to put high-speed rail in the median, you've got to rebuild the bridge and take out the barrier in the middle. Where would you go if you wanted to see some of these new ideas, like the Hyperloop, in person? One place is the Smithsonian Arts and Industries Building at their Futures exhibit. If you happen to be in Washington, D.C., that show will be up until July. Everybody assumes that, you know, in the future, everybody's going to have a flying car, right? That's what the Jetsons promised us, you know, so we have an air taxi in the show. But we also, you know, have the Virgin Hyperloop pod, the Pegasus that was used in the Nevada test run in 2020. Ashley Malise is a curator of futures. She gave us a tour. The Pegasus pod is something that looks a little bit like a monorail car, a little bit more futuristic. It's a slender sort of tube shaped design that sits on a dolly system that we actually like rolled through the whole museum and then built a 360 degree experience around. So there's a walkway that you could walk up and around that elevates you to look into it. So we wanted to try to, you know, create that experience so that you have a full understanding of all the component parts to this one prototype. One of the other fun exhibits in the show is a helicopter taxi. It's called the Bell Nexus. It is a six-duct air taxi. So it is a vertical lift and takeoff vehicle that is a hybrid electric concept model. It has six rotors on it that can articulate from a vertical articulation, like a plane prop, like a propeller on, on, a, on a jet plane, or a horizontal one, which has like the same rotor configuration as a helicopter. So it's really nimble in that sense. So it could take off and land on a rooftop, but then it moves forward and around using sort of that, that propulsion forward. When we think about, you know, an air taxi, we're thinking about, you know, a, a system of transport that's going to be all air-based. It doesn't just mean that there's more convenience potentially and that there's a little bit less, you know, congestion on our roads. It also starts to surface conversations about civic design and what happens to those impervious asphalt surfaces that could potentially become green spaces. And what does that do to our urban landscapes and our environment? So Stephanie, helicopter taxis, hyperloops, this all sounds really cool, but it sounds pretty expensive to me. 
Well, we also bear a lot of costs just from having the faulty infrastructure that exists today. It's inefficient, it's unreliable, and it drives up costs to end consumers because businesses have to pay more to manufacture and then distribute their goods. You know, there's a report card that comes out every four years, the American Society of Civil Engineers, and they estimate that the average American household loses about $63 a week or $275 a month those are costs that we bear just because we have this, you know, old dilapidated infrastructure. And so when you think about the costs, well, we're all paying a pretty heavy cost now. OK, so we understand there's a price to be paid if we don't start looking at this stuff. But I mean, when we're talking about hyperloops, I mean, this is not like getting in a car and just coming to a stoplight. Who's going to kind of guide us through this? Who's going to regulate this stuff? Who's going to make sure a accidents don't happen? Well, I actually asked Congressman DeFazio about this, and he says that there's a new office within the Department of Transportation that the Biden administration is setting up to make sure that somebody's looking at these sort of questions. You know, when there are breakthroughs in technology, you're right. We haven't had agency responsible for looking at things like Hyperloop in the past, but we know we're going to need it in the future. Of course, there's going to be a lot of this infrastructure money to go around. The question is, how is it going to be distributed? Who's going to get it? And how are they going to spend it? Obviously, states are going to have to look at what their needs are. So for some communities, it may be a hyperloop. For other communities, it may be flying taxis. Who knows? The point is, states are ultimately going to have to decide what works best for them. And hey, if you've got an opinion about how public transportation could be improved where you live, Congressman DeFazio has a message for you. Whenever I talk to people, I say, your state is about to get a 40% increase in service transportation funds, a lot of money coming to these states, and it's up to you to get the state to spend it in the right way. Thanks for listening to the best new ideas in money. You can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review. And if you have ideas for future episodes, drop us a line at bestnewideasinmoney at marketwatch.com. Thanks to Congressman Peter DeFazio, Ryan Harris, Naroa Coretti, Ashley Malise, and the Smithsonian Institution. To learn more about the future of public transportation, head to marketwatch.com. I'm Stephanie Kelton. And I'm Charles Passy. The Best New Ideas in Money is a podcast from MarketWatch, produced by Best Case Studios. Suzanne Myers is our producer. Our associate producer is Hannah Leibowitz Lockard. The executive producer for Best Case Studios is Adam Pincus. For MarketWatch, Melissa Haggerty is the executive producer, and the producers are Meta Lutzhoft and Katie Ferguson, who also mixed this episode. Jeremy Binks is our news editor. The Best New Ideas in Money theme was composed by Sam Retzer. Stephanie Kelton is an economist and professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University and not part of the MarketWatch newsroom. We'll be back next week with another new idea.